Today we made a sacrifice. All dressed beautiful, clean and virginous. They died so prettily. Their blood a symbol of what we believe, and they begged to be our chalice, and yet called out for salvation in their final moments. But they are our benefactors. Their passing will mark the fainting moments of the year and will punctuate the darkness with their momentary flare. They will give meaning and depth to the new year and will provide gravity for the beginning of the never-ending cycle. Their demise will fertilize the ground for the new seed, our seed, that otherwise falls to the ground unbidden, unloved and uncherished. They have paved the way and today, with renewed vigor, we ask what would you sacrifice? Sometimes we feel out of sorts, not quite knowing what we want or why, as if there's a glitch in reality that itches. This is considered normal. Sometimes we can feel we don't really know ourselves, why we are here or where we are going in life. The glitch is growing and enveloping us. This again could be considered completely normal. But if you find yourself at the airport, waiting for yourself to arrive on a flight from Istanbul, holding a handwritten sign with your own name on it, then you know that you have been completely complicit in the madness that has consumed the world. Your flight is late, and you can't even remember what you look like. This is when you are probably in gallantry, Mr. Smith, or whatever your name isn't, again. <laughs> Thank you, Eustace. Good morning, Gallatry. And I still love you more than you love me. We're all getting to terms with the unexpected new civic attraction down on the high street. The lovely, pulsating, sexily healing jukebox stroke iPod stroke U-boat we've all taken to our hearts. There's nothing like laying hands on a barnacled hull and listening to a tune from happier times when we're all freer, younger, and leather trousers were a passport to Quimlico on a Saturday night. Yes, everyone is getting into the love vibe round here again. Fear of death by the GSTB virus has now passed, and we are having a veritable renaissance of community spirit, enjoying the garden of earthly delights in cheap fizz and as many fantastic falafels as your face can force down. Let's go over to the council offices and hear what the mayor, Ms Lorna X, has to say on this happy, happy day. Fellow citizens, dearest florist, perpetually scared, confused by my personal army of graves, the civil servants. We've come through a dangerous time where our very existence was tested. Through personal fortitude, stiff upper lip grit, and a healthy disregard for public health advice, we are not dead, castrated, or real cricket fans. I... <clears throat> We at the council bent the rules too. During this period of hardship for us all, we were lenient on you hard-working gallantry folk, especially the self-employed. But now as confidence has returned to the market, we must again shoulder the yoke of tax-raising civic responsibility. I therefore announce that we are going to allow you to enjoy your newfound freedom, but if you employ yourself for fun, we will be levying a new pleasure tax. We will call it Pay As You Gurn, or P-A-Y-G for short. This will be an honesty tax. Everyone should pay as much as they enjoy. Think of it as taxing your fiddles. Now, Gallatry, it's time to roll up your sleeves and get back to it. We need much-needed tax dollars. Thank you. The mayor turned on her heel and hovered back to the council offices. The swish of the electric door stunning the assorted members of the press into a dumbfound gobsmackness. Well, dear listeners, I didn't think any of us saw that coming. What leadership! Community news! Remember our new campaign, An Apple Before Bed Looks After the Dead. Now we have cause for celebration here in Gallatry. We have a birthday. 
Gallatry's oldest resident has turned 107. Doesn't that just take the biscuit? We go over to Jenny Jennings, who's down at the Love You Boat with Splinter Hill resident Miss Irene Higginbottom, who is enjoying her birthday day out from the Heaven Muster Care Home and has also been given the day off from the DIY store. Hi, Jenny. How's the birthday girl? Well, let's ask Irene. Are you enjoying your birthday? Oh, yes, thank you, dear. It's great to be out of those dungarees for a day. The submarine is more lovely than I could have imagined. Tell me, dear, is it true what they say about it? Can it heal? Can it play magic? Well, yes, Irene, it's truly a gift. Would you like to give it a go? Yes, more than anything. What a wonderful birthday. What do I need to do, young lady? Well, if I just wheel you round the side of the hole here, near to the torpedo tube hatch, ah, there you go. Now, Irene, just lay your hands on the metal bar. Ah! Are you okay, Irene? Let me help you there. What happened? Oh dear, I had a jolt. I was taken back to a long time ago, as if the years had folded back on themselves, right here, right now. When I touched the barnacled skin of the boat, I felt something that I'd almost forgotten, from 70 odd years ago. Irene, are you okay? What do you remember? I was a cleaner at the old toy shop. Although everyone found the old man Canastra slightly strange, he was always good to me, and I loved working for him. Always the fun, the clowning, the smiling toys, the happy children and delight in their eyes when Canastra presented them with another beautiful wooden carved delight. During the 30s, money was tight and the shop went from strength to strength as wood was not as an expensive import. We all worked hard and soon found ourselves getting closer and closer to Canastra. He seemed very lonely and we became friends, became lovers. The submarine reminded me of my hands touching his scaly skin and took me back to those nights rolling around in the wood shavings on the floor of the workshop. But soon I discovered I was pregnant. Yes, Irene. What did you do? Well, it was frowned upon back then. We weren't married and we could never be, due to his secret. Secret? Jenny asked. His weakness was boys. He never loved them. He just wanted to understand how they worked, I guess. He wanted to take them to bits so he could build one. Not exactly legal, even then. I gave birth to a baby boy, Tommy. I loved Canastra, but I couldn't trust him with my boy. So I did the only thing I could have done, and I've regretted it ever since. What was that, Irene? Jenny asked. I gave him up for adoption. The family moved abroad. My heart was broken. I never tried to find out where they went until the aftermath of the Peterson boy incident. It was 1963. After the townsfolk had torched the toy shop, I went looking for my son to tell him that his father was dead. I found them in the end. They were living in Turkey. Tommy was a grown man by then. I told him the story and gave him the cutting from the newspaper. The cutting? Jenny asked. Yes, the cutting that showed the name of all the mob that killed Canastra, all smirking and standing over the ashes, holding burnt toys like trophy fishermen. The strangest thing, they're all called Smith. Anyway, that was a long time ago. I hope Tommy has got his own family now, safely away from this madness. As Tommy said to me that day, They're all digging their own graves with a spoon. I wonder what he meant by that. Oh, my dear, listen to me prattle on. Thank you for my lovely birthday outing. Could we go back now? I'd like a biscuit now. Thank you, Jenny. I'd like a biscuit too. An apple before bed looks after the dead. But now, crime. We go over to Chief Anderson, who has a warning for us all regarding a new crime that we are getting multiple complaints from many worried and, dare I say it, embarrassed citizens. The Chief is standing at the steps of the police HQ with the smartly dressed man, Prentice, at his side. He lifts his hands for quiet and begins to speak. Hello everyone, I want to speak to you about several reports that we've been getting relating to some strange incidents over the past couple of days. You may have seen the curious mugshots of people's faces taped to lampposts, bus stops and posted outside business premises. I know at first we thought they were a joke too. All the strange winking, gurning contorted faces as if there was a freak show coming to town. But all these people are normal gallantry residents who have been victim to a specific crime. We believe perpetrated by the same gang. The gang has managed to capture a photograph of the victim's face and throws a, well, an orgasmic how's your father, so to speak. The gang then send the photo to the said knee-trembling victim, demanding money. Or they post the picture near the victim's place of work, or outside their home, or even their mother's house. 
These criminals are always the first to cash in on something good coming to this town. Chief, surely the council was first with the fiddle attacks. The chief ignored this question and carried on. Like the victims, we can't work out how the gang managed to get the photos in the first place, as all the victims maintained that they were all alone, in complete dexterous control, and not in a public place. We have also ruled out smartphones, although I do suspect that some of the alleged victims simply hit the wrong button at the wrong time, or even the right time. However, I digress. Prentice here has a theory. Prentice stepped forward, looked at his feet for a second, and then began to speak. We believe the only rational explanation is that we have a gang of blackmailing shamans who are spirit walking into people's personal pleasure time by following the vibrations in the spirit world, partly caused by the presence of the submarine. It seems that the U-boat has greatly changed the balance of the darkness to reality ratio and now all kinds of strange things can happen. My advice is, if you're going to get into the groove with the rest of the town, use protection, like some kind of mask or paper bag over your head. Thank you. Well, dear listeners, that's sage advice from Mr. Prentice there. Seemingly it appears that safe sex, even with yourself, needs to be anonymous here in Gallatry. Remember, an apple before bed looks after the dead. A man is sitting in a bar in Chichek Pasaji, just off Ishtakal in central Istanbul. His name is Thomas Kutulush. He sits with a beer watching the world go by. The tourists, the restaurant waiters hustling them as they squeeze past in the bustle of the narrow covered art deco arcade. He watches the old doctor in his crumpled suit, old leather bag in hand and stethoscope round his neck shuffle through the crowd as he does every afternoon. The waiters all catcall and make crude jokes about him as he passes through like they do every afternoon. Today, though, the doctor stops and beckons one of the young jokers towards him in a slightly menacing way in order to whisper something in his ear. The joker, not quite sure of what will come next, apprehensively accepts the challenge and bends his head towards the doctor's. The doctor simply kisses the lad on the forehead and everyone laughs as the joker picks up. Not so cocky now, are you? Curtilish thinks to himself. Curtilish looks at his watch and finishes his beer. He pays up and goes down the narrow staircase into the bowels of the restaurant underneath the street. He goes through a slatted door into the toilet and runs water into the sink to wash his sweat from his face. As the water settles in the basin, a bluish dream loop flicker illuminates the darkened room. He is enthralled as he sees an image of a burning toy shop, a hateful crowd and a desperate clown face consumed in flames as the glass shatters over the bubbling grease paint. (laughs) Kurtulish suddenly wakes up as the glitch of reality envelops him and he runs back up the stairs and out onto the street. He walks directly to the old well at the back of the old flower market. He now knows why he bought those files of mysterious blue liquid from the beggar the other day and poured them down the well for no apparent reason. He knows what is next. Gallantry must pay. Well, if girls are made from sugar and spice and all things nice, why do they invariably smell of fish? Answers next week. Remember, an apple before bed looks after the dead. And now, dear listeners, we're going over to Jenny Jennings at the lovely U-boat as there seems to be some kind of commotion down there. Hello, Jenny. What's the backstory with the U-boat? What's the subplot? Well, it's very strange down here. The sub seems to have stopped glowing, stopped playing the beautiful, beautiful tunes. It's just a plain old barnacle wreck, like when it first arrived. Jenny, if it stops singing, perhaps it can't heal anymore either. There goes the mayor's tax raising scheme. I'd better get my test match special video out from the vinyl vault. Wait! Hundreds of crows have started to land everywhere, all over the sub. They're covering everything. The crows are gathering into an ever-increasing density. The sky blackens with murder. They're swirling around our heads in a tight mass, their motion looking like water flowing down a plug hole into the sky. I think the submarine has started to sing again. Can you hear this over the swirling and the beating of thousands of wings? Yes, Jenny, what's that? It's kind of music. This might be shot in the dark, but isn't that Turkish? Wait, I can see something coming from the bird cloud. Where is that? 
It looks like something on the road. Yes, we can see it now. It's a bucket. It's dropping faster, down, down from the sky. And it just stops, just there, above the school deck of the new boat. Jenny, did you see a bucket? Yes, a bucket on a road. Hang on, I think it's got something white on it, fluttering in the crow wind. If I just climb up here and grab it, it's a piece of paper. Paper, Jenny? Does it say anything? No, not really. It's just got the word Smith on it hundreds of times, but they're all crossed out. Hang on, there is a word at the bottom. It's not crossed out. It says, um, Lake. I wonder if it's a message from the lovely but landlocked submarine. Hello, dear listeners. It's now 9pm and we go back down to the high street where the mayor, apprentice and various council dog handlers and transformers are holding back the crowds in the submarine. It seems that something is afoot under the murder cloud and swaying bucket. The mayor stands at a lectern under the makeshift lights and raises her arms for quiet. Dearest Gallatry, we are gathered here tonight to make a sacrifice. We are all given for the greater Galatriarian good. Well, some of us. Most of us. But now we must give a little more to get our beloved U-boat, Love Sea, and my tax forecast back into kilter. Well, not all of us. One of us must give a little more. Prentice here will explain. The mayoral manicured hand beckoned the ever smart Prentice to the lector. He looked down at his notes and began to speak. I have been expecting this for some time. We have done our research and we know things and we suspect things. We know that we still have a killer on the loose and we suspect that this is the ghost of the toy shop clown, Canastra. We know that many people were killed by their own children in fires and we suspect that the toy horde possessed the kids to kill their own parents. We know that all of those burnt were named Smith. We also know that Canastra was killed in a fire started by an angry vengeance mob in 1963 and we suspect that the photo on the front of the paper that day has led to these events. All these people in the photo were called Smith, bar one. The name Lake. We know that we only have one man called Lake in this town and we suspect that he murdered his wife and hence we have him in custody. We also know that we have a request to hand over Lake so that in the spirit of democracy in 1963 we offer you a choice. Here is a suspected murderer to answer to your mob judgment. Dick Lake is led out into the rostrum. He is handcuffed and looks dishevelled and has a black eye. He stares at his feet. He looks as reluctant as a nun on a panda shoot. Mr. Lake, I put it to you that your grandfather burnt Canastra alive, and now you must answer for your ancestors' actions. How do you believe? Lake looked up. It was nothing to do with me. My grandfather was just caught up in the mob with the rest of them. He wasn't like that at all. But he was like that, wasn't he? He burnt the toy shop and the town clown down, didn't he? No, he didn't act alone. There were others involved as well. They were all seen as heroes back then in 1963 eyes. But he was alone, wasn't he, Mr Lake? The only man not named Smith. The only man whose only ancestor is still alive. The only man whose name not crossed out on that list attached to that bucket. There's no evidence that my grandfather was involved. He was just in the photograph. Prentice retorted, if he wasn't involved, why was he in the photograph? And even then, why did he not give his name as Smith to the reporter like all the others? He was guilty of clownicide or stupidity or both. You cannot escape this now, Mr. Lake. Put the murder in the bucket. Lake looks up at the crowd for the first time. I didn't murder my wife. I didn't. It was for her own good. She had colic. I simply put her down. She was in pain, poor old Bess. I set her free. I let her run in the pastures like she used to as a foal. I released her from this madness. Prentice continued. I see you implicate yourself further, you varlet. We don't need people like you here. Freelance madcap philosophers, murdering wife killers, grandson of a murdering clown arsonist, and not with the civic program. A maverick, an enemy of the hard-working community ethic. 
We should have expelled you with the other non-believers when we had the chance, but now we leave your fate to your neighbours, your fellow townsfolk, to be your judge, jury and executioner. What say you, Gallatry? Outsider? What about the clown, Canastra? He raped and murdered young boys, and I'm the one to pay for his crimes. I was born unto Gallatry. I'm no saint, admittedly. But would you sentence a man who's still alive over the ravings of a long-dead carny paedophile? <laughs> Apprentice looked him up and down and smiled. You didn't read the small print, did you, Mr Lake? When we were all reminded every day about the community programme, an apple before bed looks after the dead. What did you do, Mr Lake? You ignored it. I was in a prison cell, and I was denied access to fruit. Lake replied, Prentice continued, We all had an apple, dreamt of 39 pages of terms and conditions, and remember clicking the I agree button. We all signed up. We all sold our souls. But because of this agreement, this town, under its democratic mandate, has a responsibility for all souls, even those whose bodies have died. They have rights too, but you didn't sign up. You were too individual. You thought it was below you. Yes, Mr Lake, you are the outsider. A signed up soul, even dead in this town, is much more important than a free thinking stroke, libertarian stroke, horse murderer. And now it's time for you to pay. Prentice turned to the crowd and lifted a thumb. The crowd roared with a thousand downturned thumbs and Prentice nodded. Two burly council transformers came forward and grabbed the now kicking lake and pushed him to his knees. His head was pushed into the bucket. It is tied with white earphone cables round the neck, like a teenager on Christmas Day. They give the rope a couple of tugs and wait. The crowd goes silent. The rope pulls taut. The bucket rises into the air with the still kicking body of Lake swinging below. It rises and rises and rises and disappears into the swirling black cloud. Well, dear listeners, welcome back. Whoa, what a night. We again have peace in a little slice of heaven here in Gallatry. The black cloud is gone. The crows have returned to their sound effect duties and the submarine lights up again, serenely and plays magic to the sexually liberated townsfolk who, although with bags on their heads, are not frightened of death anymore, as much as the public ridicule for their fumblings. Well, what can we remember from this night? There are some say they saw a figure of a clown in a German officer's coat hovering over the deck of UB-65 when Lake was taken up into the sky but we cannot verify this at this juncture. Somewhere in Istanbul, Thomas Kruczynsch is standing over a drowned body of a man whose head is tied to a bucket. His work is done. In Turkey, the word Kruczynsch means salvation, but here in Galatry, it means vengeance. (laughs) Under the centenary bridge, the voices rise into a harmony as one, louder and louder. You have been listening to Gallatry, a community-funded local radio station. I'm Adam Aardvark. Max couldn't be around at the end of the show. He often needs to lie down in a darkened room and sort of, well, convalesce. If you enjoyed today's show and want to know more or simply express a simple and not very cogent opinion, then email us at welcometogallatry at gmail.com. You can tell us what you think, although we might already know what you think. Or failing that, if you genuinely have no idea, we can helpfully provide some new ideas that you can call your very own. Ideas that you can share with your friends and family and become a much more interesting and likeable person, if only to yourself. This has been a Gallatry Entertainment broadcast recorded in a haunted pub in Gallatry. No, honestly, voices appeared on the recordings that we later had to edit out. I think we got them all, but who's for know for sure? 
Anyway, Gallatry is performed by Max Black, written and recorded by Max Black and Adam Ardark. It's copyright Gallatry Productions 2015. Thanks for listening. But remember, on your next journey home, Gallatry may be just around the corner. Oh.